John chapter 16. We looked at chapter uh, 3, verse 1 to 16. Today we're continuing 16 to 18 and a bit more in the chapter. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Amen. Amen. What a wonderful scripture. God is not a cruel, anxious to pour out his anger over mankind. This text is one of the most wonderful texts to directly tell us what kind of God God is. Last week we said God is not cool, He is merciful, and we explained some of His mercy, and we look in Psalm 103 verse 8 that He is slow to anger, rich and unfailing love. He will not remain angry forever, and He does not treat us as our sin deserves. You know, God is good. God is love. He loved the world. He sent his, the, the, you know, the Savior, His only Son, His only begotten Son, to save us, and it is wonderful. So the first thing that we read this morning is the character of God and the intention of God. God's intention are good. God's intention are good for you and for me and for all men because it says God loves the world. The world, the, the word for world is cosmos. He loves everyone there's nobody excluded and that word that's a big word it's the cosmos every human being god loves he loves his creation he created and he loves and he takes care of his creation it's for everybody but because he is holy and just you know he could have sent his son or or armies of angels to destroy he could have we deserved it we sinned. We were all the the earth was filled with violence under Noah, you know, and everything. And and we were sinners, blasphemers, and enemies of God, hostile to God, strangers, separated from the love of God, and didn't care and live independently and, and our arrogance. God could have, he is the boss. He's the creator, he can do everything, but he did not. He did not do that far from him. Uh, he, saved, he sent a savior instead, and he did not send anybody to condemn the world. Amen? Jesus came and he took our condemnation. He took it so that all sinners everywhere, rich and poor and any nations could be saved if they receive him. And we see in this text the value of Jesus Christ's work. All men can be saved. That's the value of the work of Jesus Christ. If you look in this text, if you observe some of this strong expression, you will notice, should not perish. That is strong. And he said, not to condemn. Since that's the negative. Not to and not to. Not to perish and not to condemn, okay? But instead, on the positive side, that you have, uh, should have eternal life and might be safe. That is what God wants to do. Not perish, not condemn, but that you should be safe and have eternal life. That is the goal of the Lord Jesus. If you read the Gospel of John carefully, you will notice the, the theme of judgment, many, many scriptures talk about judgment or condemning or condemnation. You, and we will talk about it this morning. This, the theme of judgment in the Gospel of John is surprisingly important. And John used the word sometimes judge or condemn or judgment or condemnation you can interchange these two. It's uh, synonymous of each other. And we will explain that a little bit. And it presents to us the idea that Jesus has a very special role to play in the work of judgment. There is a judgment, but Jesus did not come for that. But he has a role in it, okay? Uh, John chapter 5, 22 and 27, the Father judges no one, but he has given all judgment to the Son. 
And verse 27, he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the son of man. We have to understand the importance of the fact that Jesus Christ, the eternal God, has become a man. This is vital, this is important. In the book of Hebrews, the letter to uh, the Hebrews, it says that it was essential that he become like one of us, that he took flesh, that he came. It is so important. He took our condemnation as a man. He came for man. He could offer his body, his blood, as a man for man. His, his, he paid the price of our ransom as a man. He could not have done it otherwise. He had to be a man, a perfect man, to be a perfect sacrifice, a perfect substitute. So because he has done that, he has received many honor. He has been exalted to the right hand of the Father in the highest place of honor ever, where he will judge, where he is also a mediator through his blood that he took with him in the heavenlies. He is the sacrifice, he is the high priest, he is the intercessor, and he continues his work of salvation for us. Even though he accomplished his mission on earth in fulfilling uh, his sacrifice and dying on the cross and raising from the dead, but he has not finished to uh, work for us in the heavenlies and the, the, the heavenly uh, tents or the tabernacle. He is there, he is actively involved in our salvation even today. But this role uh, that he will take for, for judging is, is one that has been given to him because he has become the son of man. And this is very important for us this morning. The judging function, uh, this judging function that he has been given to is not going to be in effect until the day of judgment. Okay, but before the, 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 the last days, the day of judgment, the final judgment, Jesus' role is to bring salvation, not judgment. That is what his role is uh, until now. Until it's too late, there's always hope for salvation, and this is what his role is made of. John 3.17, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn, but in order that we would be saved through him. That is his function. Uh, in uh, chapter 12, Jesus tells us that he did not come, Jesus himself about says and repeat, he did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. Uh, John 12, 47, 48. If anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. But there is still a judgment in that, and then it is coming. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words as a judge, the word that I have spoken will judge him on the last days. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. And I know that his commandment is eternal life. What I see, therefore, I see as the Father has told me. So judgment is linked to Jesus' word. Jesus' word is very important. Why is that? Because when Jesus spoke as a man here on earth, he spoke the true words of God. He did not make up his own mind and tell us some nice words or exhort us or comfort us just like a, a man would comfort a friend that is distressed or something or true like a man would have a, some compassion for someone. No, it is the word. He spoke what he was commanded to, what he was commissioned to. It's the word of God. And you can imagine <coughs> Those who proclaim openly that they are atheists, they don't believe in Jesus Christ, and it is ridiculous to be a Christian and all of this. Imagine on that day, think for a moment, I don't believe in Jesus. I remember a time when I was um, establishing a, a, a church on the campus of University of Montreal, and I would go to the cafeteria, and I would challenge the students. He says, I'm looking for someone to have a debate on the existence of God. And they would, I don't believe in God. 
<laughs> I don't believe in God. Yeah, okay, I don't believe in God. Okay, I'm happy to meet you. Happy to meet you. I'm looking for someone like you. Would you take the debate? I'm looking for someone who do not believe in God. You just says you don't believe in God. Would you speak on the side of the unbelievers that prove that God does not exist? Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> for one month. I went to every single department of that university, 40,000 students. I went to the Department of Philosophy. I talked to the Dean of Philosophy. I talked to Social Science. I went everywhere. I challenged everywhere. I challenged and I asked, refer to me the most aggressive against Christianity. I really asked for it. For one month I searched, I never found one. I never found one. But all this to say. These people proclaim openly, I don't believe in God. God doesn't make sense. You know, there's no God. One day, Jesus says, I'm, I'm not judging. You, you refuse God's word. Jesus did not. You know, when the, the Pharisees on that day were, you know, refusing Jesus, Jesus did not sit in front of them. And says, <laughs> you know, he did not. He did not. I'm, I haven't come for that. I've come for saving. I haven't come for judging. But the words that you hear me say, proclaim, one day they will judge you. Imagine every atheist, one day they will face that reality. You say, ah, it was true. That's what will happen. And then they will collapse. I destroy my life. I base my life, the, 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 all everything I, I have done, all my value system was based on what I used to believe there's no God. I did not believe. I did not pay attention to the Bible. I didn't want to believe that this is true. Doesn't make sense. A, a, a God become a man and dies on the cross. I didn't want to believe in that. One day, that word will judge them. It is going to be an awful day for them. It's going to be an awful day. And you and I, we should never be ashamed of the word of God. You know, many times, I can, if you have a Bible, you don't want to take it in a public place because somebody may see you with your big Bible. I'm sorry, I don't have my big Bible with me this morning. I have my small. We should not be ashamed because that word of God will stand for eternity and will be the judge. And it will judge you in the opposite because you have believed my word. Okay, it says here, eh? Those who believe my words will receive eternal life. We see that in, the, in John. But those who reject the words, they have a judge, my word. And why, why is that? Because the word that Jesus spoke were the word of God himself, and men refused to hear it. And this is the fact that will condemn men on the last days. Judgment on the last day will be linked to how people uh, related to, to their attitude to the words of Jesus Christ. The judgment will be related to that, okay? John 3.18, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Here we see mankind divided into two groups. Believers, unbelievers, that's all. There's no white, brown, uh, yellow, red, or rich, poor. There's no any other classes of people, uh, educated or not. There's only two kinds. Believers, not believers. This is very simple, isn't it? The word of God is simple, it's clear. You read it, you know that. I'm not announcing anything new. But we forget the foundation of our faith. We forget the reality. We get confused. We get intimidated. We are shy about our own uh, identity as a Christians, and we are, don't know how to present the gospel to other people. But Jesus himself says, listen, there's only two groups. You're in or you're out. You believe or you don't believe. That's it. And they are condemned because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. That's the condemnation that is going to come. 
because he has not believed, he has refused, he has rejected, he has hardened his heart. Jesus Christ finished his work of salvation. Now it is up to us to make our decision to reject or to accept whether we will do that. And it is a terrible thing to reject such a gift of love. Imagine, think ahead, the, to reject such a gift of love. If a man will not believe, there is no other name, there is no other way, there is no other religion, there is no other means of salvation, there is no other name given under heaven by which we can be saved. There's only one. I am the way, the truth, the life. No one can come to the Father but by me. So there are two groups of people we believe, we don't believe. That will determine the condemnation. Okay? We're clear on that? So judgment is also linked to Jesus' identity, how we believe, because he says he does not believe in the name of the only Son of God. Believing in the name is believing the person. It's believing the identity of, believing who he is, what he says, and what he has come to do. He does not believe in the name of the Son of God, doesn't believe in the mission given to the Son of God, so that is what happened. And realize something, in the book of John, the Gospel of John, you will see, there's not a lot of miracles in the Gospel of John that you read about. It's not like Mark or Luke or something. In the Gospel of John, what you will see is very strong debate between his opponents and himself based on his identity. This is what happened. There's a miracle, there's a debate. There's another miracle, there's another debate. And the more you go in John, the, the stronger the debate, the, the, the harder, the, the, the more evil, and then it leads to the, the tribunal and then the, the death of Jesus Christ, his opponents. So his identity was a matter of serious debate in the Gospel of John between his opponents and himself. Even though Jesus' primary purpose for coming in the world is not judgment. Nevertheless, Jesus also thought that he had come into the world for judgment. Wow, now it seems to be contradicting. It says he has not come to condemn or to judge, but to save. But now we will read the text that says that he came for judgment. Okay, so how do we explain that? John chapter 9, verse 35 to 41. We are familiar with the text in the background. This is the healing of the man born blind uh, on that day. And I want to read from verse 35. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and having found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, and that's the main verse that I want to draw attention to. Jesus says, For judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, Are we also blind? And Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you see, we see your guilt remain. So the, uh, remember that. Your guilt re re remain. You know, we can say judgment is the flip side of salvation. You are saved, you are judged. If you are not saved, what happened? What's on the other side? Okay? So it's the flip, flip side. So when Jesus says, for judgment, I came into the world, here the word uh, judgment in the Greek is not the act of judgment, but the result. It's like a separation, a sifting, a sorting out. So what Jesus says here is like the preaching of the gospel produces this effect, has this effect. When you talk of, to someone about Jesus, there's always an effect. Either a very strong uh, rejection, or an acceptance, someone seeks more and want more, or someone refuse completely. There's a sifting, there's a separation, there's a dividing line when, when Jesus comes in the discussion with, with your friends, with, with anybody. So this is what Jesus says, for judgment 
I came into this, this world. What Jesus would accomplish through his teaching and his death was uh, bringing a separation. The, and separation, think about it for a moment, separation is the basis for, for judgment. W what is a judgment? This is good, this is bad. You, you, you judge, you sort, you divide. This I want, this I don't want. This is qualified. This is disqualified. This I can accept. This is, this is rotten. This is good quality. So th there's a, a judgment. And you see that uh, when Jesus talked about the judgment, and uh, the sheep will be on the side of the, of the Lord, and the, uh, how do you call that, the, the other ones? The goat. The goat will be on the other side. And, uh, so there's a sorting. There is a division. Those whose names are written in the book, in the book of the Lamb, are going up. Those whose name are not are going down. Okay? It, it's tragic. It, it's, it's a sorting. It's, that's what is happening. So that's, that's the context of that verse here. So the, the background is, is like this. There will be, in that text, a separation between those who will accept him, his word, and those who will reject him. Uh, there was a division in verse 16 of that text. Uh, the, 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 there was a division. People would say, uh, the Pharisee says, no, he is not. And people would say, how can a man like him uh, do great miracles? And, and the, the, the text says, there was a division among them. Already in the crowd facing this, this event, there was a division. The Pharisees, already de decided to expel anyone who would confess Jesus as the Messiah. They already draw the line. Before this event, anybody who would confess publicly that Jesus was, would be expelled of, uh, of the synagogue. They already passed a judgment on the blind man. They told him, after he explained just his, his words of testimony, he, 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 he says, you were born completely in sin, and you want to teach us? We are the teachers of the law. So already, they are so arrogant. They, they judge him. They pass a judgment. The Pharisees themselves pass a judgment on this man. You are born in sin. W what does that make them? They were not born in sin. They were not in sin. You know why they said you were born in sin? Because he was born blind. If he was born blind, he must have been a sinner because he was cursed being blind. So that was the, the opinion that they had. But we are the religious leader. We are okay with God. So they, they saw like this. That was their, their eyesight in that place. So here is the, 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 the separation. The beggar was truly, physically, and spiritually blind before he met Jesus, okay? Yet, both his eyes of his heart and his eyes were open. He was blind, but then he could not only see, but he could on also see Jesus. Yes, where is he that I can believe in him? It is I who is speaking to you, I believe. And he prostrated himself in front. So his, the, eyes, uh, the eyes of his heart were open. And not only the eyes, uh, his eyesight was, okay? And he listened to the word, and he believed it, and he experienced the grace of God. The Pharisees, on the other hand, have seen the miracles of Jesus all the way through to that one. If they had listened to the word of Jesus and sincerely considered the evidence that Jesus was manifesting, they too would have believed and they would have been born again. But they did not. So they were still blind. And Jesus says, your guilt remain. And that is leading to condemnation and ju the judgment to come because their guilt stays with them. The other man, his guilt was taken away because he believes in Jesus. Believing or not believing determines whether someone will be condemned. Another example of that we discuss on Wednesday night in the Bible study is the, uh, when the Pharisees in John chapter 8 verse 3, the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery and placing her in the midst. Was she guilty? Probably she was guilty of adultery. Was adultery a sin? Yes. So she was a sinner. She was in sin. 
In verse uh, 7, they continued to ask him, and he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And then silence. Nothing happened. Nobody moved. They are waiting. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Then Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? Because they, at the beginning they condemned her, didn't they? They brought her to be so that they wanted the, you know, the punishment. So has no one condemned you? She says, no one, Lord. And Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. He did not come to condemn her. He came to save her. And that is the same for you and for me. We stand here today just because the same Jesus has spoken the same word of grace to all of us. And we need to remember that for the rest of our, of our life. You know, because if we don't, we will turn like the Pharisees to other people. And we will see their sin. And we will condemn their sin. And we will see bad things about them. And then we will measure ourselves based on their standard and our standard. And we will think that we are better than them. And that is going back to the, same, to the same place. I want to read a quote. Pay attention to that. I read it on Wednesday night. This is a Mr. Darby, a Bible translator of the, of the past. He says, It comforts and quiets the depraved heart of man if he can only find a person worse than himself. It comforts and quiets our hearts, our guilty hearts, if we find someone worse than us. He thinks the greater sin of another excuses himself. And while accusing and blaming another, he forgets his own evil. And then he rejoices in iniquity. And that is what we find in that picture, but not in Jesus Christ. Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. This text also is, speaks to us if we have not yet been caught, you know, because sometimes we, we, ha we go on with sinful habits or something nobody knows about, and we haven't get caught. So there were a lot of people in that crowd that were pointing the finger to her, but they had not yet been caught. And maybe this is what their conscience was accusing them. Uh, Jesus was writing something, we don't know what it is, but they left. Because he says, if you have not sinned, whoever has not sinned, if your conscience is clear, you are not worse than her. And you know what I was reading in the, 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 the commentary about this text is that in the time that this text had been written, there were a lot of adulteries in the Jewish community. You know, because in the Old Testament, they says that if a husband was jealous of his wife, Okay, what he was supposed to do? He was supposed to take his wife to the temple and she was going to drink some kind of poison, some bitter water. And if she was, you know, uh, denying her sin, but then she would have been guilty, drinking that would have, you know, she would have, I don't know, melt, all the inner organs would have been destroyed or whatever, something horrible would have happened, okay? <laughs> But you know what? This would work only if the husband was himself sinless, or not, not guilty himself. But if the husband was himself uh, involved in adultery or having affairs or sleeping here and there, and then he came home and was jealous about his wife, then it didn't work. He couldn't do that at the temple. So at the time of Jesus, this custom, even though it was in the Old Testament, was abandoned already. And that is an indication that there was so much cheating among the men of the time that on that day when Jesus says, if you have not sinned, then you can throw the stone, then they were, their conscience accused them and they left and they went away. But the, 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 the point here is that Jesus did not. Remember in the beginning of the Gospel of John, it says that Jesus brought 
grace and truth. Okay, you remember that in John chapter 1? So when Jesus spoke to her, neither do I condemn you. We have an example of grace. I don't condemn you. But Jesus did not tolerate or encourage her. He did not say, uh, uh, go and sin as little as possible. Or your sin is not as bad as the sin of your neighbor. It, Jesus did not do that. Jesus says, go and sin no more. So he was, he was in the truth. He maintained the standard of God. He says, okay, you, I'm not condemning you, but you have a choice. You have to decide what to do. Here is the standard of God. Now that you have been spared, I'm not condemning you, then live accordingly, live for God in all of this. So this text illustrates God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. That's the point. That's the point. Verse 19, chapter 3, verse 19 to 21. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his work should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Verse 19 says, and this is the judgment. And here what we want to say is like, uh, uh, again, is the process of judging. It's like a verdict. Uh, Jesus is the light. He came in the world. And he disturbed a lot of people. He, because of his holiness and his righteous words and his perfect life, he made a lot of men uncomfortable. His presence uh, exposed the sinfulness of men. And people didn't like it. They were not comfortable. So Jesus died for the sin of all the world. But did men love Jesus for that? Do men love Jesus? Okay, somebody, you announce the gospel and you tell people, okay, people, this is a good news that I'm announcing to you. Jesus Christ came to this world and he died for your sin. Everybody should say, yeah, wow, who is Jesus? I love him so much. Look at what he's done to me. And, and they should love Jesus, isn't it? If someone gives you a million dollars, will you love that person? If someone gives you a house or gives you a boat or gives you something, uh, you know, of great value like, or show great interest and uh, do something wonderful for your benefit, w w won't you be, you know, thankful for that person? So the whole world should be falling on their face before Jesus. Wow, Jesus, you are so wonderful. No, they don't. They resent Jesus. Why is that? The verdict. This is the verdict. Man, choose they fall in love with darkness. Darkness is their lover. They love darkness because they can go on doing the, the, the sinful and the evil things. It's in the sinful nature. This is what happened. Men fall in love with the darkness of sin. They prefer sins to having Jesus as Savior. You know, because the light, when the light comes, darkness is exposed. Whatever is in darkness is exposed. Just like a cockroach. Like a cockroach, you turn on the light, you chee -chee 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 -chee. <laughs> just go like that, you know? <laughs> Loving darkness more than the light leads to judgment. <laughs> Loving darkness more than the light leads to judgment. That's another thing that we learn here. But in order to come to the light, you need the participation of the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, it doesn't work. The Holy Spirit is essential in avoiding judgment and coming to the light. In John chapter 6, verse 8 to 11, when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. This is so clear. This is so important. The Holy Spirit is the one that allows us to run away from the darkness and run to the light and, and be saved. With, without Him, we can't do that. The Spirit convinces the world of the sinfulness of rejecting Jesus. He confirms that Jesus is righteous in everything that He said, and He proves that the dead of the resurrection of Jesus uh, cast away the ruler of this world. The judgment is already done. When Jesus died on the cross, 
judgment took place. The separation is now in the process. And the thing that is, remains to be done is that people will choose which side they are going to be. The judgment is already done. The, the, the verdict is there. Why would people be condemned? There's only one reason. Because they love darkness more than they love the light. That is why. And this is not God. This is now us. This is ourselves. We are bringing condemnation on ourselves. Human being brings condemnation on themselves by choosing. We choose to reject the, the gift of God, the offer of salvation, and it is a choice. This is by choice. Amen? Amen. John 3.36, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. That's wonderful. Do you have eternal life this morning? Yes. You believe in Jesus. That's what the Bible says. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. The guilt that the Pharisees still had remaining on them, it's still there. The condemnation is still there because the way to remove it is to believing and to receiving the gift of Jesus Christ. John 6, 47 says, I tell you the truth, anyone who believes has eternal life. Very simple. We use it in evangelism all the time. Very simple. Anyone who believes has eternal life. Not will, maybe, if you do more, if you don't do that one, no. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you have eternal life. My favorite verse in the Bible, one of my favorite verse, John 20, 31, but all these things concerning Jesus, what he has done, the miracles he has done, have been written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you have life by the power of his name. That is so wonderful. This is so simple. This is the main message of the Bible. This is, this is it this morning. All we have to do is be bold to proclaim it and change our attitude towards sin because the, what the Pharisees did to this lady here was not pleasing to the Lord this morning. Hallelujah. Judgment is linked to the words of Jesus Christ. Judgment is linked to Jesus' identity. The life of Jesus produces a judgment, a sifting, a separation. Believing or not determines whether someone will be condemned. Loving darkness more than loving light leads to judgment. And this is what the Bible says. And I want to repeat the opening verse this morning and close with that because this is the heart of God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. That is the good news that the Church of Jesus Christ is proclaiming all over the world. Th that we have to show in our homes, that we have to show in our office and in our schools. This is what we are not ashamed of. This is what we are proud of. And this is what we have received. And we have already deciding the, di the dividing line on which we stand. If you have not, this morning is your chance to do that. Let's, let's close our eyes. Hallelujah.